I was telling Matt right before uh, service started that uh, last night, right before as I was going to bed, I, I put the sermon from Key Connect on, pushed the play button, and laid in bed listening to the sermon. And then I got really nervous because <laughs> I thought, I, I'm not sure I can do that again. <laughs> um, for a long time, I pastored where we uh, had, uh, a t- first in the conference, I was a two-point charge. And we always laughed about how the first sermon and the second sermon between the two churches was always different. And uh, then later, I pastored where we had two services, and there was often shift and change. So um, Tyler and Matt and Tim, I don't know if you'll get what you're expecting or not today, but uh, we'll try to do that. And I'm going to trust what the Lord's going to do is he's going to bring what needs to be heard here today. Uh, And he's going to somehow get my attention enough uh, to speak through these words from his word and through my experiences and my voice to, to share with us what he wants us to know. Um, so uh, I've been, with this whole year in the conference, we've been focusing in on a theme called Speak Jesus. Uh, and uh, we introduced that at annual conference, and then Pastor Tim calls me up, hey, would you mind if I use the theme that you used at annual conference? And so all last summer, you guys heard messages about Speak Jesus as you looked at the messages in the book of Acts, uh, as the, um, uh, the apostles uh, shared messages about Jesus with other people. And uh, so I've uh, continued to do that. So when we came to Key Connect this year, I wanted to continue to hone in on that theme. As, and I ended up bringing a message called, Who Do You Represent? Who do you represent? And that's what I want to talk and share with you about today. Who do you represent? And to do that, I want to begin with two stories from my life. Um, just this past fall, Cindy and I were down... Um, near Messiah University for a Wesleyan Holiness Connection conference. And uh, so we had checked into the, we had, were staying at a hotel down there, and I got up the morning of the conference and uh, went to the little breakfast room at this uh, hotel, and I was having breakfast, and Cindy said, just bring me something back. I'm going to stay in the room, and, uh, which is what we often do. And um, so, um, so I went to the room. I got me something to eat. And I'm sitting there, and I look across diagonally from where I'm sitting at a table just over to my right, and there's a man sitting there, and on his table where he's eating is a faux leather-covered book. Now, I automatically jump to a conclusion, it's a prejudice probably of mine, that, oh, this guy must be a Christian, Because the only people that I know of that read faux leather-covered books are Christians. Either they're a Bible or they're some kind of devotional book. So um, it worked out that when I got up to go get some stuff together to take back to the room for Cindy, he also got up and went back to the area where the food was. And we were standing right next to each other, and I turned to him, and I said, Oh, I said, I saw you were reading this morning. What are you reading? And he said, oh, I, I'm reading through the Bible. And, and he starts to talk to me about this. It's a devotional book that has him reading through the Bible and stuff like that. And so um, I said, oh, that's great. I said, I'm reading through the Bible as well this year. And uh, I read at night. And last night I was in and I told him what book I was reading uh, the night before. And, and immediately he replies back to me. Well, you know so-and-so who were our founding fathers, and then he starts talking about some political stuff, and, and he goes on and on. And, and I left that breakfast room, taking the stuff back to the room for Cindy, and I began to think, oh, Lord, thank you that somebody else didn't ask him that question. I mean, I thought to myself, what an excellent opportunity, what an open doorway for him to talk about how Christ had been changing and transforming his life, and so he began every morning in God's Word. And yet, he chose to talk to me about political issues that he was passionate and cared a lot about, and I'm glad he cared about those things, and I'm not bothered that he cared about those things. But I just felt like there was an open doorway for him to testify about the difference that Christ was making in his life, and he chose that instead. Another story. 
a young man who, in, uh, that uh, I'm close to in my life and uh, that um, I care a lot about. Uh, we, uh, from time to time, we'll have some conversations about things that are going on in his life. And, and so um, he's part of this uh, group that gets together, sometimes uh, depending on how often he can make it, but it's a hobby of his, and he gets involved with that hobby. And one day he told me, hey, and there's a guy coming to our group, and he's a preacher. And I thought, oh, that's really exciting, because I'm always, uh, this person's a millennial, and uh, many of you perhaps know that millennials, we're told at least, are leaving the church in droves, and they're not, they're not engaging in the faith within the confines of the church. And, and so I thought, oh, this is great. This preacher, this pastor is stepping into a place where he can have a lot of witness around a whole lot of millennials and stuff like that. And so, uh, and then I come to find out as we talk some more, not only is this guy a pastor, he's a free Methodist pastor. Oh, Goody, goody. And I was really excited. And um, until a few months ago, I, I get a call from this person, and um, he's telling me that uh, this pastor happens to have a blog around this hobby that they have in common. And um, it's a video blog, actually. And he had been at a, um, at a convention that uh, centered around this hobby of his. And um, when he came back from the convention, he was so upset about some things that happened at the convention that he did a, a, a blog about it. And what he, what the thing he was so upset about is they, they had a, room, a quiet room for persons of color. And so he went online in this whole video blog about, well, they didn't have a, video, a, a quiet room for persons of my color. And uh, he just went on and on and on about it and stuff like that. And, and this friend of mine, he said, uh, uh, said, uh, you know, my friends watch this stuff, and it just really turns them off. It, it turns them off that per someone would say this or someone would be so insensitive. And, and, um, and I just thought, and, and then they went on to tell me, and it's not the first time he's posted stuff like this. And my heart was just broken. Here's a fellow pastor, not just a pastor, but a free Methodist pastor, who had an inroad into an into a age segment of our population who desperately needs to hear about Jesus. But that's not what they're hearing from him. Who do you represent? I want us today to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 20. Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Paul's writing a church that's, uh, it's a troubled church. All you have to do is read First and Second Corinthians to, to understand it's a church that has a lot of trouble, a lot of turmoil, a lot of issues. And here in this second letter to them, he, he writes this section 
Um, and that's what I want to, we're going to hone in on this today. The first thing that stood out to me in this passage was, is there in verse 14, about the middle of the verse, where Paul says to them, Christ died for all. Christ died for all. And if you're using the note guide, that's your very first fill in the blank uh, this morning. Christ died for all. In the verse, it actually says, we believe, Paul says, we believe that Christ died for all. It's, he's not just him, but we, the, the, the fellowship of believers, the body of Christ, we believe that Christ died for all. Do you, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Sadly, there is actually part of the church who uh, has a very different theology of salvation uh, than we have, and they would say that Christ only died for the elect. But we're not part of that part of the church Christian family. We're what we call Wesleyan Arminians. And we believe that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for everyone. His atonement was made available and it was for everyone, for the sins of the whole world. He died for everyone. Christ died for all. He died for uh, your kids. He died for your neighbors. He died for your family. He died for the coworker who you don't like very well. Um, he died for all persons. Christ died for all. But sometimes I'm afraid that we have reinterpreted that, that we've sort of decided that Christ died for the people that I like or that Christ died for the people who are like me. Christ died for the people who believe like me. But that's not what Paul says. Paul says that Jesus Christ, when he came and he died, he died for everyone. The person you don't like. It's why I think Jesus talks to us about praying for our enemies. Because Jesus loved them, and when he died, he died for them. We believe Christ died for all. But until we believe that, that misbelief will affect our actions. It will impact how we relate with other people. Until we come to that place that we believe, that truly believe that Jesus Christ died for everyone, our actions and our love for others and our, our zeal, our passion to, to see other, everyone come to know him will be stilted. It will be limited. Christ died for all. The next thing I notice in this passage in 2 Corinthians is, is uh, that we need to stop evaluating others from a human point of view. Stop evaluating others from a human point of view. In uh, verse 16, that's what Paul says. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. We've stopped doing that, he says. In fact, what he really is going on, what he's actually implying here is that we used to do that. We used to do that, but we have stopped it. We've, we've put an end to looking at other people from just a human point of view. We tend, we tend to look at others and make judgments about them. Maybe it's because of how they look. It could be because of where they live. It, it might be because of certain beliefs they have or that they espouse, that they talk about. And we make judgments on them. We make evaluations of them. And when we do that, we're usually evaluating their value, their worth, their importance. Stop evaluating others from a human point of view. You know, I know this. But I have to admit, it's hard, easy, it's really easy to fall back into the trap 
of walking in a store and seeing someone who looks really different from me and making a quick judgment about them, about who they are, about how they act, about their value. And Paul says to the Corinthians, you've got to stop doing that. You've got to stop doing that. And, and what that means is we've got to start having the eyes uh, uh, that look at people how Jesus sees people. We need to ask Jesus, oh, Jesus, help us. Help me to see people with your eyes. Help me to look at others the way you look at them. Now, sadly, many, many people in our culture believe that when God looks at them, he's just shaking his finger at them. But you know what my observation is? Is that when God looks at them, he's spreading his arms out for them and inviting him, them to come to know him and to experience him, to receive from him. The next thing I notice in this passage is that Paul says we need to be controlled by Christ's love. We need to be controlled by Christ's love. There at the very beginning of verse 14, Christ's love, he says, is what controls us. Christ's love controls us. Tertullian, one of the early writers in the Christian faith, he, he, uh, when he imagined what it might be, what others would be saying about God's people, he said, he, he could hear them saying, he could imagine them saying, my, how they love one another, in stark contrast to how they felt about others around them. And the reality is, is we'll never believe that Christ died for everyone and we'll never stop evaluating others from a human point of view until we begin to let the love of Christ flow through us. Until we begin to be controlled by Christ's love. Until it's his love that, that enters into the motives of my heart. in how I react to others. On the way to church this morning, as we were coming through Titusville, I saw several people along the way. Some of you maybe came down uh, 27 and saw them too. One guy was weed eating some grass and one person was just walking across there at the end of the uh, hardware store, or the building supply place. She was just walking along there. And, and, um, and, and I thought, okay, so Chris, what, are you, what conclusions are you drawing about those two people? What are you thinking about them? The one guy's working on Sunday morning, out cutting, cutting the grass with it. He's not in church anywhere that I can tell. Um, and, uh, and I began to automatically draw some conclusions about them and stuff like that. And, and, and I thought, I'm going to preach this message this morning. And, 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 and Jesus, would you just love them? Would you love them and help them to know that they're loved? And would you change me, change my heart so that when I look at a person, I don't automatically jump to evaluations of those persons, but I automatically jump to knowing and believing that God loves them, cares about them deeply. Um, about once every year, I teach a class on free Methodist history and polity. And um, one of the things that I have my class, typically I've had my class do, is we talk about the freedoms. Where does this name free come from in free Methodist? And so we lay out the historic freedoms of the free Methodist church. And I say those are interesting, but they really don't translate well, in some of them especially, uh, to today. And so I always ask them to, I mean, like one of the freedoms was free pews. I mean... <laughs> we can't even get people to sit up very much up here, right? I mean, um, sorry, no, I'm not judging. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the front seats aren't the valued seats anymore, it seems like. And, uh, but, but, but that doesn't, they're all free. Um, so I asked them, would you translate those into a contemporary way of what, what, 
Why do we take the concept, the principle that that tried to convey, and how do we move that into the 21st century? Well, a couple of years ago, our study commission on doctrine were tasked by a board of bishops to do just that, to take those historic freedoms and to move them into the 21st century. And here's one that I especially like. Freedom from spiritual, political, social, or conceptual alliances that compromise or subvert the exclusive allegiance we profess to Jesus Christ. As followers of Jesus, as fellow free Methodists, we should live in a freedom from spiritual, political, social, or conceptual alliances that compromise or subvert the exclusive allegiance that we profess to Jesus Christ. And so when I re in, interact with others, my interaction should come through my allegiance to Jesus, not from my social standing, my political views, my group that I'm part of, whatever, the club that I belong to. It all should come through this exclusive allegiance that I have with Jesus. Over the last few weeks, I've uh, been at a new church, a United Methodist church who came our direction uh, this last year, and we've taken in the first free Methodist members in that congregation. And so for two weeks, I actually, we did, we brought in new members there, uh, members. And um, I, I found it also interesting in the very membership covenant that we say we uh, adhere to as free Methodists, this allegiance is right in there. We commit ourselves in allegiance to Christ. It's an exclusive allegiance. I am his. And I'm going to interact in this world through his lens, through the way he sees things. The next thing I notice in this passage in uh, 2 Corinthians is that our God-given task is to represent Jesus. We do all this other stuff. We, we, we do this from love. We, we do these things. But it's all because we're called to represent Jesus. Represent Jesus. You are the testimony that others see. Lived out. In real life, they get to watch you. Your family members, your co-workers, the, the person who checks you out at the grocery store or the hardware store, the person sitting next to you at the, at the sporting event, they all get a front row seat to observe you and to observe how are you doing when it comes to representing Jesus. Paul says in this passage, this section, um, that actually uh, what it means for us to represent P Jesus is that we are called to reconcile people to him, to reconcile people to him. In verse 18, the latter part of verse 18, he says, and God has given us, you and I, this task of reconciling people to him. Now, I'm going to mess up an analogy that many of you have used for a conversion for ages. Some of you know the, convert, the bridge thing, right? There's a chasm, there's the two hillsides, and we were on the one side, God was on the other, and Jesus Christ became the bridge that got us across. Can I tell you what this passage tells me is that you're the bridge. You're the bridge that gets people to Jesus. A number of years ago, uh, I took some training with Dan Spader uh, on, uh, uh, on healthy church, having healthy churches. And, and uh, one of the things I found interesting, and this was a long time ago, it, the stat might be really different now, but at that time, for a person to make a decision to follow Christ, they had to encounter 5.4, I don't know who the point four person is, but 5.4, here's the key word, authentic Christians. 
5.4, they had to encounter, they had to have interaction with at least five and a half persons who were solidly, truly living out their faith for them to make that decision. You're the bridge. God has called you to be a bridge that helps to move people from the li- their lives that are broken and hurting and wounded or from their lives of great comfort and ease to him. Because the reality is all the comfort and ease still doesn't bring peace. I can have anything I want. I can get anything I want, anywhere I want, at any time. I can have it from Amazon the next day. Or at least two. But it doesn't bring peace. It doesn't bring joy. It's just stuff. And so my guess is many of you, you know people who have little, and you know some people who have lots but they all need to come to know Jesus. And God has called you. He's tasked you with the responsibility, with the opportunity, really, the great opportunity to lead them to faith in him. In fact, Paul goes on in this passage in verse 19 to say, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. This wonderful message of reconciliation. It's not just, oh, we can, we're called to reconcile, but it's a wonderful thing that you have. Every one of us has this wonderful opportunity to share this message of reconciliation with others. A few weeks ago, I sat at a restaurant across the table from a young man, 15 years old. His parents had expressed interest that him and his younger sister were interested in being baptized. They hadn't been baptized as infants, and so they thought they really should be baptized. And so I said, well, look, they're old enough. It's not your decision any longer. I said, so it, it's their decision, and so I'd like to meet. So I'm sitting across the table. The, the kid, he likes ice cream and hot chocolate. So we went out to a place where they served ice cream and hot chocolate, and we just sat and talked. And, and at first I just tell me what you know about Jesus. I just want to see he's grown up some in the church. And what do you know about Jesus? We begin to, I begin to listen to him and share. And, and I begin to talk to him. And I finally asked him the question. Have you ever asked Jesus to, to be your savior? To come into your life and to lead your life? And he says, no, no, I haven't. And I said, would, would you like to do that? And he said, yes, I would. And so a little bit later that afternoon, I'd picked him up from school, and uh, a little later that afternoon, him and I just sat in, and I helped him as he prayed a prayer, asking Jesus to come into his life. What a wonderful moment of reconciling a person in their life and their walk to God. He was doing some religious stuff. He read his Bible from time to time. He came to church every Sunday with his parents. I don't think he was objecting or fighting that at all. But he didn't know Jesus. He hadn't given his life, committed his life to Jesus. And just two Sundays later, I was able to baptize him into the faith, him and his sister both. Now, let me just tell you, that was an easy one. Most of them aren't going to be that easy. And there's times when you get really frustrated. And I understand that. Because it's, it's not that easy. It isn't easy at all. Because there's so many other forces in our world, so many other distractions that's working against your work, your call to be, a, to be reconciling them to him. But don't give up. Don't give up. Keep at it. Keep befriending them. Keep loving them. Keep letting the love of Christ flow through you to them. Be that bridge that reconciles people to him. Then we're also called, given this task to represent Jesus, by serving as an ambassador. By serving as an ambassador. In verse 20, 
of this passage. It says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Come back to God. You know, an ambassador is someone who represents their government, their national leader to others, to other countries, other nations. They, they represent their leader. And, and what that means is they have to lay aside their personal preferences in order to represent their leader, to represent their nation. Now, many of their preferences might completely align. But my guess is for any ambassador who serves our nation, at least, they don't completely align. But they have to lay aside those personal preferences in order to represent the official stance of the nation that they're representing. A little over a year ago, Cindy and I were on a trip, a John Wesley tour, a Wesley tour in, uh, in England uh, with the bishops and a number of the other superintendents and a few other denominational leaders. It, it was an amazing I think about 10 days that we were there in England. We had never been there before. And we saw some amazing sites. We were in some amazing cathedrals. We were in Westminster Abbey. And so before we went, we had watched the uh, carol service in December because we were there in the first two weeks of, first two weeks of January. And we went back home and watched it again. And we said, oh, yes, I was there. That's where we stood and looked over the rail and all this kind of stuff. And when the coronation took place, oh, yes, I know right where that is and stuff like that. So we were there. We were at St. Paul's Cathedral. We were at Wesley's Chapel there in London. Um, we went to Epworth. All of those were really interesting places. But, but can you tell, let me tell you what stood out to me the most. I, I realized later I should have put a picture of it in, in, in the slides. Because it's, it's, it's nothing. It's just some, a little stone patio looking thing. And a, and a rail and a plaque. And all around it are apartment buildings. It's the top. It's the edge of... Henna Mount, Henna Mount. Henna Mount is just outside of the city of Bristol. Um, and it's, um, it's where John Wesley went and preached to coal miners. And he would stand on the precipice of the top of the hill, and the miners would all be down the, the hillside. And he records in his journals about at one point when he's preaching at Henna Mount, he, the estimate is that there were 1,500 coal miners. And, and he talked and writes about, as he preached God's word, about the tears of the miners cutting rival, rivets, rivulets in the, in the coal-dusted faces of the coal miners. And about them repenting and turning and calling out to God. And here's something you need to know. John Wesley hated, I really mean, he hated field preaching. He had much rather been in a building like this, standing, well, he'd want a more substantial pulpit, probably lifted up about five or six more feet. That's what he liked. That's what he was used to. That's what he had grown up with. That's what was comfortable to him. But his good friend, George Whitefield, gave him a little push and got him to walk out of the pulpit and into the fields to preach. And in, number, in a number of places across England, there's places where Wesley went to preach in the fields to people. It wasn't always easy. Sometimes he got fruit thrown at him or eggs or he was pelted. It was dangerous. But Wesley was willing to lay aside his comforts in order to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. To lay aside what he wanted and what he liked in order to represent his Savior, Jesus. Do you know, God wants to speak through you. 
God wants to speak through you. You, you see, the reality as I look across this room this morning is, if you, we all made the list of people that we know, our list would be really different. And your list would have people that I don't know at all. I only know you, some of you really, very casually. I just see your face here. I don't know you by name even. But you see, there's people you know that I don't know, and people that someone else on the very row you're sitting on doesn't know, but, but you know them. You work with them, or you went to school with them, or you see them every time you go to get gas at the gas station if you happen to go in these days. God wants to speak through you. To who? Maybe it's to the person who's, who's just beleaguered and tired and worn out. Maybe he wants to speak through you to the person who thinks they have it all, and yet they're so empty. Maybe he wants to speak through you to that person who's same-sex attracted and is just really disturbed and tr struggling with where they are and who they are. Maybe he wants to speak through you to a family member. And it's an uncomfortable thing to do. He wants to speak through you. But the big question for every one of us this morning is, do our voices, our actions represent the open arms of God? Do they welcome people? Or are they like stop signs that push people away and keep people from wanting to see Jesus? Because they see us before they see him. They see us before they see him. You know, the scriptures proclaim to the world some really good news, but sadly too often the very people who are supposed to be proclaiming this good news, they're busy proclaiming other messages. Other messages that don't really represent God's heart, God's passion, God's love for the world. And, and, and so if someone that you know would be asked, what's, what's your friend most passionate about? What would they say? Oh, they're really passionate about religion. Are they really passionate about Jesus? Would they say that? Or, or would they say, oh, they're, they're just so passionate about politics. That's what they talk to me all the time about. Or man, they're so passionate about sports. Man, it doesn't matter if it's football season or basketball season or baseball season or track, whatever. They're telling me all about it. You do know that sports is the religion of America. It's the God we worship in America. And I'm going to pick on some guys here, sorry. Maybe, I guess gals too. Um, uh, do they hear more about hunting than they hear about Jesus? Well, I don't, there's all kinds of things it could be. But there's just some things, if someone would ask, they would say, that's what you're passionate about. Now, you can use some of your passions as vehicles, instruments to be used of God to reach someone for faith. But so often, we talk about the passion, but never get around to talking about Jesus. The good, you see, we have good news that we get the opportunity to present every day. And, and that good news is that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 10, verse 13 to 15. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That's why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. We have a wonderful message to proclaim. 
But the reality is, is they have to hear it. They have to hear it. You see, we have been sold a, a, a bill of goods that all I have to do is be it. And, and, and yeah, you do have to be it and do it. But at some point, that will only take you so far. At some point, you have to say it. At some point, you have to speak it. I, I grew up in, um, well, I'm old now, and I grew up way back when. And we had a TV show we watched, uh, Gomer Pyle. And, and I, I don't know if you remember the sergeant on Gomer Pyle. Some of you, may, maybe some of you younger ones, walk Nick at night, or I don't know if it's on there or not. But, but uh, the sergeant, he used to say, I can't hear you. Can I tell you the reality is our world doesn't hear about Jesus from us? I was staggered at Key Connect when Bishop K shared, shared stats about the number of persons, this, I think this was millennials, who, who are believers. That was hard enough. And then she said, of that number, if I remember the stat correctly, 40% of those believe it's wrong to tell somebody else about Jesus. 40% of people who believe about Jesus, believe in Jesus, are walking with him supposedly, believe it's wrong for them to tell their friends and their family about Jesus Christ. Have we allowed other messages to crowd out, to overshadow the message that others desperately need to hear? Now, and let me just tell you, I'm not talking, don't be, please, please, don't be obnoxious. Don't be preachy. Don't be condemning what the Bible says. Um, but simply share the love of Jesus. Let it flow through your life. Speak about it. Speak about him in ways that are winsome, that are, that are attractive. You know, um, as I look back over my life, I think uh, when, uh, when we first moved into Old City, we lived in a little neighborhood called Cibberly, Um And we had a chance to interact with a number of teenagers in that community, in that neighborhood. And, and um, you know, I, I'm really saddened that oftentimes I was too busy talking to them about their bad habits and not talking to them about Jesus. That they could fix their bad habits, and it, not a single one of those changes in their life would have saved them. But it's only Jesus, only Jesus that can save them. They have to hear. And, and since they have to hear, the reality is someone has to tell. Day after day at 10.02, except for on Sunday morning, because I don't want to interrupt the first song that Sean's doing or whoever's call, Tyler doing the call to worship, my phone goes off. It's a reminder to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth workers into the harvest, to send out people who will tell. And let me just tell you, the message of those entering the harvest needs to be crystal clear. Jesus Christ loves you and he died for you and he invites you to be a part of his family. Jesus loved me and saved me. And he's changing and transforming me. And I'm not all that I need to be yet, but I'm making progress because Jesus is at work in me. Today I join the Apostle Paul in proclaiming that you, every one of you, are being sent to share this great good news. My hope is that you'll have beautiful feet that take the good news of the Savior who walked to Calvary so that everyone could be saved. That you'll have beautiful hands that embrace all, just like Jesus, who reached out to the woman at the well, a tax collector who had climbed up into a tree, and to a thief even hanging on the cross next to him. 
that you'll have beautiful lips that pray the words of Jesus to our Father in heaven for the lost of the world, the lost around you. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And use me to be a bridge to you for them. Let's pray, Lord. Help us to examine our hearts about who we represent most often and use us as your ambassadors to reconcile the world to you. Thank you, Lord, for those who spoke to us who are willing to speak up and helped us to come to that place in our life. Amen. Well, there's some next steps that are on the back of your connection card this morning. And uh, here they are. First, to confess and repent for the ways that we've pushed people away from meeting Jesus by our words and actions. Oh, God, forgive me. I had an opportunity. You gave me a great opportunity, but I was too busy talking about, and it could be all kinds of stuff. Secondly, to commit to representing Jesus well in our spheres of influence. What's your sphere of influence? Who has Jesus strategically placed you near so that you can tell about him? And then third, to pray that Christ's love would control you as you interact with others.